But what we're looking at for those kinds of materials is potentially putting it in bioplastics. Mm. So in this case, it was coffee grounds turned into biochar and made into a what I call bio-upgradable uh, bioplastic. So the, the binder will disintegrate, but the, the carbon in this will still be there. Mm. So. We need to start making more conscious material choices. We set up an initiative called Make Fashion Circular. It's a tsunami of change. So biochar is basically taking any kind of organic material and baking it in an oxygen limited environment. So I like to compare it to putting something in an oven versus putting it over a, a campfire. So baking it is, is going to uh, turn it into a charcoal-like substance uh, versus ash, which is what you would get if you, you put it in an incinerator or a campfire. And originally the context of biochar was for use in soils to improve carbon content and help things like yield and managing water resources. But the, the markets for biochar since the last few years has really started to look above the ground, as we'll probably talk about. Yeah. So what kind of materials can you make biochar with? What, 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 you know, because we've, we've been in a report recently, for example, um, about the role that f cities can play in shifting the food system to a healthier, more generous tra trajectory. Each year, hundreds of millions of tons of organic waste come out of cities. So is that, would that be a good source of feedstock for biochar? Yep. Actually, it used to be that uh, things like crop residues and woods were the main uh, feedstock for biochar, but increasingly, at least in the U.S., where there are these organic mandates in terms of what you can and cannot send to landfills, people are looking for alternatives as to what they can do with large amounts of sewage sludge, uh, heterogeneous food waste, and things like that. So while there are uh, other options such as uh, anaerobic digestion, composting, thermochemical conversion or pyrolysis, this baking thing that I spoke mm -hmm. about, is actually a really good way to handle certain types of waste that may be difficult or uh, contaminated, so you might, want, uh, might not want to put those in a yeah. compost. Okay. Well, I, I see you've brought a nice um, Select. biochar selection with you, so maybe you can talk through some of these um samples and, sure. and tell us where they come from and what their uses are. So this is my prized collection. Mm. I'm, I'm one of those that likes to pick it up from wherever I go. Mm. And I've been doing research with different uh, universities and companies. And as an example, the Rochester Institute of Technology is very big into carbonizing different kinds of food waste. Mm. So we've been looking at both pre-consumer. So I think we have something from a cherry juice producer here where we were so carbonizing. The, the pip or the skin? Yes, or, yeah, the, pips, the pips, or yeah. as we call them, seeds. seeds yeah. They also have a different kind of food waste uh, called pulp. Yeah. Uh, and we wouldn't want to carbonize that because it has a lot of other purposes. But this sort of thing, um, you know, it's just being landfilled. Mm. So it can not only produce a lot of heat, it can make a very decent biochar. But there's other types of food waste from cafeterias and things like that, which are heterogeneous. Yeah. And those may not necessarily be good for use in soils because they tend to have a lot of salt or chlorine. So we started looking at other things you can do with that. And some examples are putting it in building materials, very lightweight, oh, okay. very insulating. Uh, and then we also have some other heterogeneous uh, food waste, such as coffee, uh, spent coffee, coffee grounds, grounds. Yeah. not sure if that's it. Uh, this one actually happens to be cardboard. But what we're looking at for those kinds of materials is potentially putting it in bioplastics. Mm. So in this case, it was coffee grounds turned into biochar and made into a what I call bio-upgradable uh, bioplastic. So the, the binder will disintegrate, but the, the carbon in this will still be there. Mm. So. And you've got some things. you've got some pellets there or something in yep, that tube. This What's is that? this is from a Canadian biochar producer that is making a kind of plastic. He's replacing the carbon black, which is made from sour glass, with biochar. So he is going to be making five gallon buckets that he's putting his biochar in with these. Yeah, I see. Yeah. 
So um, I understand there are, oh, and sorry, and there are a few, what are these in these uh, containers here as well? This tube here, is that a Yeah, so interestingly, we're starting to see. Happy brush? <laughs> yes, I, I did bring a toothbrush if you'd like to brush your teeth right yeah, now. But will it make my teeth go very black? <laughs> yes, <laughs> I see, okay. temporarily. Okay, maybe we'll do that later. <laughs> <laughs> and the other is mouthwash. Mm -hmm. But if you look in certain cosmetic stores, you start mm -hmm. to see a lot of materials that have uh, charcoal in them. Mm -hmm. And what's interesting to me is they're not really promoting it as a sustainable thing. It's just a trendy thing. But I think what they're doing is displacing the microbeads, which is a good thing to do, uh, with charcoal, which is a very abrasive material. Yeah. But when it gets into the water system, it's actually not going to so, do any harm. Okay. So the it's exfoliating, gonna, yeah, right. and it, okay, and it right. gets into, and it just, and actually enhances the natural system. Exactly. It gets well, actually that's a, because I understand there's many applications for biochar, but one that really interests me is um, the, uh, the idea that it can increase soil fertility, or it can sort of help with soils anyway. Um, I used a quote in my intro about this black revolution. Uh, that was from a Brazilian network of uh, biochar producers called mm -hmm. Embrapa. And they went on to say that it, biochar soils, and they were talking about this terra preta soil mm -hmm. in, 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 in Brazil, is probably one of the richest, most fertile soils in the world. They couldn't exhaust the soil fertility in 40 years, and it's the only soil that can actually regenerate itself. So tell me how does biochar enhance soil fertility or help plants grow? Yeah, so interestingly, since those soils in the Amazon were discovered, we're actually finding more and more indigenous cultures around the world that have been doing very similar things in China and Japan and Europe. Uh, and, and a lot of it may have had to do with a combination of their cooking styles over a campfire and their sort of waste management. So once the fire was over and you had these coals, you might bring out your pots that were kind of your indoor bathroom and dump it on there because it would absorb the the uh, odor but it also absorbed the nutrients and then you would start creating these fertile soils which they believe was one of the leading factors as to um, being able to have had such a large population down there in the Amazon. But what it does in the soil in addition to adding long-term stable carbon is it it houses different types of microbial life, uh, which we're finding now has an ability to boost the immune system of plants and trees. It also holds on to nutrients longer so that in our current system where we're constantly putting fertilizer in, which just gets washed away mm -hmm. in the next rain, it's able to hold on to it for a longer period. So it becomes kind of a slow release yeah. uh, fertilizer when combined with nutrients. Mm -hmm. And it also is really being shown in, in dry areas to improve water management, which yeah. is you know, increasingly important in a lot of parts okay. of the world. Because, yeah, so as I understand, it's very, very important to get, build your soil organic content, mm -hmm. so your carbon content. Right. But not all carbon is the same. So there's available carbon and would you, a biochar, which is perhaps, it's less available because the available carbon is about feeding the microbes and creating these biologically active soils, but the biochar plays a different role. Right, so they usually call it labile carbon, which yeah. is what is consumed by microbes, mm -hmm. or recalcitrant carbon. Yeah. And so when you're carbonizing this, putting it in an oven, you're basically burning off a lot of the things that the microbes generally like. Yeah. And the hotter you burn it, the more of those that burn off. And so when you put it in the soil, it becomes a very stable form of carbon and can last for hundreds or thousands of years. So. And hence why the IPCC and Project Jordan have, have identified it as this sequestration technology. Exactly. Yeah. Can you, do you have, can you give us an idea of the potential um, if biochar was sort of rolled out to its, say, full potential or some kind of potential? What bigger role could it play in um, addressing the climate crisis? Yep. So the IPCC and Drawdown both throw out this number of 1.7 gigatons of carbon per year that it can draw down. My co-author Albert Bates and I just wrote a book called Burn Using Fire to Cool the Earth, and we look at these non-soil uses, and we think that number could be much higher uh, because we all the places where you would want to put 10, 20 tons per hectare 
might not be feasible. It might not be economically viable. So we believe that there are a, a, there's a lot more storage capacity out there. Yeah. We also believe that the, the sources for the biomass are larger than what had previously been considered. So for example, they didn't look at carbonizing manure or sewage sludge, and we're finding those are pretty big areas for targeting as a, as a biochar yeah. feedstock. So as I said before, I think it, the hurdle before was, well, people don't know about it. So there's a big push ever since the IPCC report that came out last year to try to educate people. Um, yeah, and so the, what is this IPCC report? It's the so last year, the special report that came out in October was saying it's no longer enough to just reduce. Mm -hmm. We must rebalance. Gotcha. Yeah. We must secure carbon in places that keep it from going up into the yeah, atmosphere. Lock it down, yeah. And so in that report, they listed half a dozen technologies that they believe can material help, materially help that, and biochar was one of them. So ever since then, we seem to have been getting a lot more serious interest from investors and uh, companies are getting a lot more inquiries about, you know, <laughs> moving the technology. And we also now are having a couple of carbon markets that are using biochar in their carbon markets, and I think that's um, helping to boost interest in it as well. Yeah. Yeah, I'd like to, um, yeah, interesting you mentioned the carb markets, because I'd like to just talk a little bit about the sort of the economic uh, rationale for it, because so often these days it just, you need to tell a good economic story Absolutely. in order to, you know, scale these things up. So can you talk a little bit about the economics of biochar? How, will, how can we make it work? We've got, we've got revenues from the sale of the biochar. We've yep. got, how, you know, how, so there's how a couple of different that? stories that seem mm -hmm. to resonate. One of my mm -hmm. favorite recently is in Peru, uh, cacao farmers were uh, about to lose the market in Europe due to regulations on the amount of cadmium that they were allowing in cacao. Mm -hmm. They were given five years to solve this problem and there was no resolution. So one of the folks in the biochar industry down in Peru has been taking the green waste from the city of Lima, carbonizing it in a fairly low-tech manner, and using it around existing cacao trees to help uh, draw in the cadmium and immobilize it. Mm -hmm. And so they've been able to get the levels of cadmium down enough that they can still continue to sell in this market. So the economics of that is you either can't sell anywhere uh, and then you have to replant and do something totally different or you spend five, eight dollars a tree so that you can still sell. Yeah. That's, okay. that's a great that's uh, model. But other places in the developed world are, are leveraging some of the energy produced during the biochar production process. So as an example, the, uh, I just did a study tour last week in Finland, and they're putting all the excess heat from the biochar production process into the district heating system, and they get paid for that. Uh, and the co-products of that are the biochar and something called bio-oil. And the bio-oil, they can store and also burn that for fuel when, you know, the price for it makes sense. So obviously not in the summertime. Another place we visited a year ago was in Austria, and they are using the excess heat to generate electricity for a town of about 1,000 people. And they have the ability to vary the production of biochar from, say, 5% by volume of the intake to 15%, depending on the market for the biochar. And it used to be that they couldn't find a market, and now they're selling all of it as livestock feed in Europe. So the economics are really changing fast as these markets develop and people start hearing about it. Yeah, amazing. But carbon pricing, a cost on carbon would really make the story work, or, or make the economic rationale much stronger. I think so. But at the moment, that there are a few voluntary um, sort of yes. programs, but it's not international. Yeah, so the first one just started this spring in Finland. It's mm. called the Puro Marketplace. It's specifically carbon removal. They had three different products, of which biochar was one, and the buyers can determine which product they want. So we only had one biochar producer that went through the whole life cycle assessment of, of determining really how much carbon per ton of biochar was being sequestered, uh, but he was quite happy. I think he ended up getting 
close to 50, 50 euros per CO2 ton equivalent. One of the interesting things about biochar is that I originally fell in love with it for the, the climate change impact, but it really can be framed in so many ways, and especially if you look at the UN Sustainable Development Goals, it can really help with food production from a resiliency perspective. So in my part of the world where we have plentiful water, but we're starting to see longer periods between uh, rain or heavier rain, having soils that can absorb and hold water for longer periods is really helping farmers to not have to put in irrigation systems. Um, and we're finding in places uh, where they're impacted by um, fungus and, and all these things that come as a result of too much rain, that the ability to have air in your soils is helping, you know, to, to you know, be more resilient and, and you know, yeah, increasing water storage and yeah, 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 yeah fascinating.